Hello, welcome to the first lecture for week one of uh, the course 4091 Mathematics Education 3. This is your last Maths Education course, if you, or at least the last compulsory one you have uh, in, if you're doing the undergraduate primary degree. Uh, and so hopefully this is a chance to build on what you've done in Maths Education 1 and Maths Education 2 and to draw some of those threads together. Uh, we're hoping too it helps you to get ready to go out and teach in the classes in the future. But by now you would have already done some practicums and you would have already taught some mathematics in schools and hopefully you've uh, enjoyed that and you're beginning to see yourself as a teacher of mathematics. Uh, hopefully now you're beginning a bit more confident and developing a passion for mathematics uh, because what we really need is good primary teachers who go out who really love mathematics and think it's important uh, and interesting and vibrant and help pass that on to the students. And in this course, particularly we want to challenge you to analyse and synthesise and evaluate your knowledge of teaching and learning in mathematics and also to look at how students learn uh, and how you might build upon that. So buckle up, hopefully you're here for, um, to enjoy the course and we really hope you enjoy it. You've got some great tutors and um, they will give you some plenty of practical tips and ideas. So in the lectures we won't have uh, will be mostly information giving. It's difficult to do much else when we're uh, recording them like this. But in the tutes, you'll have lots of chance to engage and do practical things. Now, each week what we'll do is give um, one or two online lectures. Um, normally, you'll, they'll have one lecture which has had got two parts. Partly this is because no one wants to listen to someone talk for two hours. We'll also post the slides on the Learning at Griffith site. Uh, and then there'll be, these lectures will be augmented by some activities and tasks. So hopefully that makes sense. You'll notice as we go through that uh, in these lectures, sometimes I've put a lot of notes. It's not that I'm going to read them all to you here. Uh, it's because when we post the slides up in the Learning at Griffith site, you can go back to them and have a look again. And particularly as you go through, you'll see we have quite a few um, hyperlinks to other videos, to documents and other things. And we won't stop and diverge to them here. I'm sure if you're watching this on your phone, that would be um, quite painful. But what it does mean is in, in your own time each week, you can click on those, follow them and follow up the tasks and activities involved. So that's the point of having them here. That's why there's so much information. That's why the, all the links are here and they'll appear in these lectures here but only to point you to them for you to do after. So the point here is you'll have these recorded lectures, but then you'll have to go back to them and particularly using the slides which are, are in the Learning at Griffith site, follow the links, follow the activities and do them uh, in your own time. And if you need to, of course, you can come back to this video. And if you've got any questions, you can always take them up with your tutors as well. So. This lecture is an introduction to the course, Critical Issues in Mathematics Education. And there's lots of critical issues and the critical issues that are here today might not be the same ones that will be here uh, in a few years time. But as we stand, these are some of the critical issues. And we want you to think about these things because this is the environment where you're going into. Uh, if nothing else, we know that most people who come through the mathematics education curriculum over the last 50 years, come out the end of their maths education, whether it's at year 9 or year 10 or, or year 12, most people come out thinking maths is boring and useless and they don't like it and they never want to do it again. And the biggest challenge of that is where did they learn these things? Well, they learned them at school in our classes. I taught them. So hopefully your teachers, as you go through this, you're developing ways to not teach children those things because that's default what they might learn. So really think um, carefully about how you can get students to engage and enjoy mathematics. So here's the lecture today of what I'm going to cover, critical issues. Um, and like I said, these are just some of the critical issues. They are not all of the critical issues. So the first one is teaching in this century versus what it was like teaching last, the last century. Often you might hear the term um, teaching 21st century learners. Well, in a sense, you haven't got any choice. They're the only ones you've got. Um, but it's not the same as it was. 
kids are different and there's a YouTube clip there for you to click on and follow and when you look at see what you think about what they say how does that impact your teaching and particularly how does it impact your teaching of mathematics um, if you've been on practicum which all of you have done what did you notice about the learners and your teaching now and how is it different from when you were at school even though some of you were at school and uh, not very long ago but in primary school is it different are the learners different so some of the things we've noted uh, and have been found through research is the student have more autonomy. It's not so directed all the time. So how can you engage uh, your teaching of mathematics with students who have more autonomy? How can you help them to learn maths from that perspective? Student autonomy is not a bad thing, it's just different from what it was when I was at school. All right, going, so in the 20th century, students didn't have a lot of autonomy. You basically did what you were told. But you certainly if you've, particularly, it depends where you've been on practicum, but you'll go to school here where the classroom might have um, students in the class, some sitting in a normal desk, some sitting in a group desk, some on bean bags, and some of the kids might be outside all doing the activity they learn. They have autonomy about how and when and where they learn. Even in this course, we now don't have lectures where you come and sit in a big hall when I talk to you. Uh, you can watch this video whenever you want. You can watch it on your phone, you can watch it uh, on your computer, you can watch it on your laptop, you can watch it on your iPad. You can choose not to watch it at all, but if you're not watching it all, you won't know that I just said you're not watching it all. So student autonomy has changed the way we teach, and it's certainly changed the way we could teach mathematics. Um, certainly the values that are around today are somewhat different. So the Industrial Revolution, which was a long time ago, but that shaped what learning was like in the 20th century. It was very much about learning stuff putting it in your brain because uh, you had to have it there ready to do things. Whereas what are the values that underpin learning now? Uh, it's certainly more about not knowing stuff, being able to find stuff out. And some things that are important now weren't important in the past and some things that were important in the past are not important now. Um, there's certainly now a bigger push towards catering for student diversity and student passion. So you can't just... Um, teach straight down the middle, teach them the content uh, and just hope the ones who are a bit, uh, bit behind maybe will catch up somehow mysteriously and the ones who are advanced won't get too bored. You need to connect with their students' passion. What are they interested in? Uh, and then the whole movement around learning styles has come out in the last uh, 20 years and what a difference has that made? So some kids think they're kinesthetic learners, some say they're oral learners or verbal learners. Um, I think all of us are a little bit of all of them, but we might have a preference. So we need to think about <coughs> how we can cater for those different things. And a simple thing might be just to say that, well, you need to have some variety. And if your maths education, maybe you didn't have much variety. Maybe every lesson looked the same. And different sorts of pedagogies are available now that weren't available in the past. If nothing else, of course, technology has had a huge difference on how we teach and, and learn. So as a teacher, how might we cope with all these things? Hopefully in this course you'll get some ideas. But here's one thing we know from the research, particularly related to maths education. Most teachers teach the way they were taught. The problem is, as you can see from even these simple lists here, the conditions of what you're teaching in have changed. So you can't just go out and teach the way you were taught because teachers often teach the way they were taught even if they didn't like the way they were taught. So the challenge for you is to try and think how can I develop my professional identity and craft as a teacher to, to help and deal with the current context with the students that are performing and the different ways they see and enact in the world. That's not an easy thing but it's also a fun part of your job. Alright, this is the second issue is the overcrowded primary curriculum and if you want to Go secondary, the overcrowded secondary curriculum. And again, there's a link there for you to follow. Um, <coughs> these are being revised at the moment, but one thing you can probably know for sure, they'll revise it, but it'll still probably be crowded. So this makes it difficult sometimes to um, have a meaningful curriculum 
<coughs> when it's overcrowded, we tend to keep pressing on with things and going on and on and on, even though the students don't necessarily understand what we've done. The goal comes to finish the curriculum and teach it all, <coughs> even if the students haven't necessarily understood it. So this is going to be an ongoing challenge for you. Uh, how you can cope with the curriculum which has got too much content in it. And there's ways you can deal with it. Sometimes you can uh, not just go in a didactic way, sometimes you can group things together in investigations or projects where kids can learn a range of things at the same time. Um, sometimes you can catch things up or you can work through didactic things as they know, as they need to know things. But there's no short answer to this. I can't give you a silver bullet how to fix the overcrowded curriculum. Um, <clears throat> I've been on uh, curriculum advisory groups for a number of years, particular for senior secondary. And we've talked about this uh, overcrowded curriculum. And then, of course, the next question is, well, what will we take out? And then no one can agree about what needs to come out because everything's important. One of the biggest problems of the overcrowded curriculum is we tend to teach all the content as if maths is only about the content. And we forget that students need to learn how to think mathematically, how to reason and, and uh, argue mathematically, all those sorts of things, which for many people's views are more important than just knowing the content <coughs> because you can always access the content after. But again, something for you to think about and as you read that document, see what you think. How can you deal with an overcrowded primary curriculum? What's really important and what things are you going to sort of um, give less attention to? Now you will understand some of this because you've been in schools, not just as a teacher but also as a student. You need to make sure you can deal with these things in other ways because the, con the curriculum is not a prescription. It's a, it's a list of stuff that has to be covered and you can deal with it in creative ways. You don't have to go through it point by point. How can you do it in the time you have available? So again, we've got no answers there but here's some um, Statistics about, or not really statistics, but just some numbers about how Australia fits uh, with the number of subjects that they have to cover. So not just mathematics, in Australia we have 16 subjects. But you can see in other countries they have less. So, so our curriculum tends to get a bit crowded. All right, the third critical issue is, of course, the increase and the focus on STEM. Now, this is uh, not a new phenomenon, but it's become particularly important over the last uh, or six or seven years, I suppose, and, and probably it, it could be something that fades from uh, focus in the next few years or something else becomes important. But the government has certainly put a lot of emphasis on STEM. And some people say STEM, some people say STEAM, some, all sorts of acronyms about what it is. But part of the problem is no one really knows what it is. Uh, if you really want to read uh, something specific about this, I suggest you try and get some of the work from the uh, ELPSA project out of Canberra University which looks at STEM practices, which is of course broader than just mathematics. But ma mathematics is included in STEM, um, but sometimes it gets lost. Uh, and what people might mean by STEM is often more like inquiry learning. So if you're gonna take a STEM approach and this covers some of your mathematics, you just need to make sure in the inquiries that the mathematics is also covered and made overt. Uh, if now, you'll see at the top there, there's a video for you to watch. And once you do that, <coughs> here's some questions to you to think about. There's some important messages in this video from a particular school in terms of relating to students' learning and how that learning relates to their lives outside of school, their interests in and outside of school, and how it relates to an integrated curriculum where we cover, rather than saying, right, we're doing maths now, and we're doing science now, we're doing technology now, we try and link them together. Um, how it looks at for students and teachers working together, etc, etc. I, I hope you've had some experience with some STEM units during your practicum. Um, I'm sure it's still going to be around for a while when you start your teaching career. So thinking about how you can integrate these things in, but while still maintaining the integrity of the mathematics and the science and technology and engineering that the students need to learn as well. It's a really interesting space and it's a good chance to do some, some teaching and learning that's really of interest to the learners. Uh, the fourth critical issue 
is the um, just the review that's currently underway of mathematics education approaches. Now, you can see a link there to the Australian Association of Maths Teachers document. Uh, this is a professional body for mathematics teachers in primary and secondary schools in Australia. And I encourage you to have a read of that. It could give you some practical ideas. It also identifies and, and talks about some of the key things that affect student engagement. Uh, the cynic in me would say we've had these things happen for a long time. For 60 or 70 years, students have um, gone through mathematics and, and not engaged with it. They drop it as soon as they can. They think it's um, of no use to them and those sorts of things. And so I'm not sure that having another one's going to change. What will make a difference is having teachers like you when you go out in schools and really emphasise the importance of maths and the fun and the excitement and the interest in mathematics and how mathematics can be useful to them. And this is about connecting it to their real lives. But there's some ideas here that might help you with your teaching. Uh, and there's some ideas about how we can stop students drifting away from mathematics to do less and less mathematics. Because increasingly uh, there is a view that mathematics is becoming more and more important as people become less and less interested and engaged with mathematics. So this is a critical issue for you as teachers because if anyone's going to help students leave school with a positive, engaged understanding and appreciation of mathematics, it's you. Uh, and the other critical issue here is about maths by inquiries. Uh, this is a debate that's gone on for a long time where people talk about direct instruction versus inquiry-based learning or constructivist approach. Do you teach the kids exactly what them, you want them to learn, they do the exercises and they learn it, or do you help the kids learn and understand it through doing inquiry and different sorts of things? And the truth is you can find um, research reports and things that support both points of view. One of the things we know is that mostly over the last 70 years or more, students have learned mathematics by direct instruction. So we'll have a particular mathematical concept, <coughs> The teacher teaches it, gives the students some examples to do. They do the textbooks and they come back and they do the next one. And by and large, it hasn't worked. Uh, it works for a, a select small few, but for most students it doesn't. Uh, and this means, amongst other things, in Australia at the moment, we're about 20,000 maths graduates short every year because we just don't have anyone who goes on to do mathematics at higher levels. I think it starts in primary school where we need to help students to get engaged in mathematics and using an inquiry approach is one way of doing that. Now, it's also useful to do inquiry because it's interesting and fun for the teachers and the students, but it's also more demanding for you as a teacher. You have to know your mathematical content and the material so you can help the cute students see and find things. And it doesn't mean you have to do inquiry all the time. Sometimes the best way to, to, to do things is just to tell the kids and help them to learn it uh, and understand it. But it's something that I think is increasingly important if we want to engage learners and so therefore we put it here as a critical issue. And again, there's another link there for you to follow um, after this. <coughs> now, uh, again, here's a video that you will be able to um, see. A link, sorry, uh, towards uh, one school which uses inquiry-based model, and you can uh, have a look at it and s see what you think. Is there things in there you can take away for your own teaching of mathematics, even if you don't take this entirely inquiry-based approach that this school does? Um, also, here I'm linking to the Melbourne Declaration of the Education and Goals for Young Australians, which is a, a critical document in driving education in Australia. Goal number two says that all young Australians become successful learners, confident and creative individuals and active and informed citizens, and this includes mathematics. And if you read the curriculum, this is explicitly talked about right at the front. So what this means is when you're teaching mathematics, you should be teaching students to become successful learners of mathematics, confident and creative individuals in mathematics and active and informed citizens who can use mathematics in understanding and, and living in the world. These are not just um, words that apply to other subjects, it applies to mathematics as well. 
And if you um, look at some of the goals, I've just highlighted some of the key things there. <clears throat> School should develop fully the talents and capabilities of students, in particular when students leave school, they should. And then you can see they should be able to analyse and do problem solving. They should be self-confident and optimistic, have high esteem in mathematics as well as in science and reading and everything else. So here's a problem already. Most kids leave school with no self-confidence, no optimism and low self-esteem in regards to their ability to use and, and do mathematics. <coughs> they need to make sense of their world. They need to be active and informed citizens. <coughs> so all those things are listed there and are government documents, things we're required to do and often we partition them off from mathematics and say, oh, that's about social studies or science or something else. So how can you do all these things in mathematics? So anyway, welcome to this course. This is the first lecture for this first week. I hope you're ready to be challenged and try new ways to understand and do mathematics. Uh, I don't want you to go out and teach exactly the same way you were taught when you were school. I want you to go and change the world. And that starts with teaching mathematics in vibrant and interesting ways. All our hopes and aspirations are resting on you because you're the teachers who will carry this through the students. And so it's a big responsibility, but it's also something fun and exciting for you. So I hope you're up for the challenge and I'll see you in the next video.